to talk about a parable of Jesus at the end of the Gospel of Matthew for a couple of reasons. One is it's a parable that bugs people. It's shocking and strange, disturbing, and I found over the years that people complain a lot about it. And see, the second reason is it'll help us to understand how to approach the Bible. Because people just get hung up a lot on the Bible. And I think they, they don't know how to enter into these stories and they get stuck. So I want to talk about this from chapter 22 of Matthew. It's the famous parable of the king who gives a wedding banquet for his son. So you know the details. The king is having this great banquet, so he sends out messengers to invite people. And they say, no, I can't come. I got this, I got that. So then a second time he sends messengers out. And this time, not only don't they come, but they, they kill the messengers. The response of the king then is overwhelming. He sends his troops and they kill those murderers and they burn down their city. At which point, the king says, now invite anyone. Go to the you know, hedgerows, invite anybody. So in they come and the king joins the party and sees a man there without a wedding garment. And, he's, and he throws him out into the darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, this parable is odd. And a lot of people read it and say, what are we supposed to conclude here? That God is a sort of psychotic tyrant who is falling in and out of emotional snits, who overreacts, invites people to a party, they say no, and he burns down their city and kills them? Doesn't this give uh, support to Richard Dawkins' claim that God is, is an ogre, that God is an is a, a unbearable uh, maniac? You know? Well, here's my first observation about this maybe with people like Dawkins in mind. Go back to Flannery O'Connor, the greatest Catholic fiction writer of the last century, in my judgment. She said, in a land of the deaf, we have to shout. Now remember, her stories were like this. Her stories were violent and strange, full of weird, over-the-top characters. Her own word was macabre. My stories are macabre. A lot of you know, devout Catholics who are told, oh, Flannery O'Connor is a great Catholic writer, they read her stories and they're, they're shocked. I've had Catholics come to me and say that they just they put the book down, they couldn't handle it. It's a bit like the reaction to this uh, story. But keep in mind her line, in a land of the deaf, you have to shout. She felt that in our hyper-secularized society, a lot of people have grown deaf to spiritual themes. They need to be awakened. They need to be shaken by the shoulders. How do you do it? Well, by telling an over-the-top, exaggerated, tall tale that's meant to get your attention. That's what this is like. Here's what we shouldn't do. And please, everyone, as you approach the Bible, remember this. We shouldn't read this in a straightforward, literal way as, a, as an allegory. So just as the king behaves in this story, that's how God behaves. So God falls into emotional snits. God falls into terrible rages. God goes on these murderous rampages. No, no. It's a story. It's a story that's meant to wake us up to certain spiritual realities. And it does it through exaggeration. Read a lot of the great storytellers over the centuries. Look at the work of the great artists, how often they use exaggeration to make a point. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at the details of the story. So, a king is giving a wedding banquet for his son. In, in Jesus' time, it would be impossible to imagine a more high-level invitation to receive than that from a king giving a wedding banquet for his own son. To get some sense of this, the President of the United States has personally invited you to the wedding of his daughter or his son at the White House. And, and the invitation has come personally to you from the president. Or better, better, a special courier from the White House has arrived at your home bearing a personal invitation from the president to come to the White House for the wedding. Now, what would you say? Chances are you would not say, oh, let me check my calendar. Or, oh, let me think about it. Or, oh, you know what, Mr. President, I'd love to come, but I'm going to go see a movie with my buddies that night. See, the first comic exaggeration in this story is the reaction of the people. That you'd get this invitation and you'd say, oh, i got to go to my farm. Oh, I'm busy with something else. You'd never say that. Here's the highest figure in the society inviting you to the highest level social event 
with the best, most interesting people at the best and most interesting place. See, that's the point. What you don't say to that person is, I'm busy. Now, the next step. So the king sends another round of invitations, this time sent by these uh, emissaries. And this time, the people not only refuse the invitation, they kill the courier. So now, put it in our situation. You've, you've refused the first invitation from the president. So now a second one comes, delivered by personal courier, and you get it, and you kill him. You kill the courier. You see how, how weird that is, that response of the, of the uh, people is just impossibly off, which is why the king then responds in this high dudgeon, in this high rage, and he kills those murderers and burns down their city. Don't literalize this, but now see it as a reflection on the history of Israel. God, not just the president, not just an earthly king, God, the king of kings, the king of the whole universe, has personally invited Israel, personally invited Israel into a intimate communion with him. Now stay with the wedding imagery in the New Testament. Who's the son but Jesus himself? who's come as the bridegroom. He wants to marry the world. He wants to marry us. The Father has sent an invitation to come to the wedding banquet of his own son. You are going to be included now in the divine life. That's the invitation you receive. What do you do? Oh, busy. Oh, I got something else to do. I'm too bored with that. At the limit, I kill the person who's bearing the message. That's, of course, Israel killing the prophets that were sent to it. That's the first thing we're meant to see here, is do you have any idea what you're doing when you refuse the divine invitation? What you're saying no to? The story is meant to grab you by the shoulders and shake you into an awareness. Don't you get it, what you're being invited into? So, how do you read the king's anger? Well, in some ways, it's proportionate to this weird non-response that he gets. But see, don't literalize it as though God falls in and out of emotional states. God doesn't have emotions the way we do. As though God is sometimes favorable, other times not favorable. God is love, we hear from St. John, and God is eternal and unchanging. That's all God is, is love. So what's his anger? His anger is his desire, I'd say passion, but that has a kind of emotional overtone, his profound desire to set things right. That's God's anger. Don't emotionalize it or turn God into a dysfunctional father. That's literalizing this language. It's God's passion to set things right. And that's God's anger, I would say, up and down the Bible. That's the right way uh, to read it. Okay, so go back to the parable. Uh, They've refused. They killed the messengers. The king has burned down their city. And now he sends out the general invitation to everybody to the highways and byways, to all the hedgerows, invite anyone who can come. What's that but God's universal offer of grace? So this is the New Testament speaking now. That God invites Israel, those are especially chosen people, but now God invites the whole world to the wedding banquet of his son. Read Paul's letters under that rubric. Paul going out to the whole world to say, you're invited to the wedding banquet of the son. You're invited to become a, a bride of Christ the bridegroom. So in they come. In they come. These are people now that have responded to the invitation. Maybe, I mean, you've heard the divine call in a million ways, through sermons, through the Bible, through the church, through its sacraments, through the saints, whatever. You've heard this call, and you've responded. Good, you've come to the banquet. Then the last little weird uh, turn in the story is the king comes to this banquet filled with with celebrants, and he sees this man who's there but doesn't have a wedding garment on. And, of course, that was part of the custom of the time. When you were invited, you wore the proper garment to the wedding. If you didn't, it was insulting to the person that invited you. Okay, so the king sees him there, and he's, he's so angry that he binds him hand and foot and throws him out into the darkness. And, again, we're tempted to say, well, isn't this a little over the top? Isn't the king just a little kooky here? No. What's the wedding garment? Think now of the general invitation which is the offer of grace, right? Gratia prima, grace first. 
We respond to that grace. We say, yes, I accept that invitation. I will enter your house. Right? Through the greatness of your love, the psalmist says, I have access to your house. It's a beautiful line. It means the temple there. But through the greatness of your love, your grace, I have access to your house. Good. I've accepted the invitation. But now, but now, act like someone worthy of this house. Clothe yourself now in love and peace and nonviolence and compassion and um, uh, charity. Clothe yourself in such a way that you can move worthily about this house. If the king comes and finds you, you've responded, but you've not changed your life. You've not been converted. You haven't done anything to conform yourself to God. Then you're not worthy to move around in that house of the saints. There's the point. Not God falling into a snit, but God calling us now to respond fully to his grace. That's the right way, it seems to me, to read this parable, which is shocking. It is over the top. It's exaggerated. Its purpose is to wake us up to these very profound spiritual truths. 